Now, the person who worships Allah with iman and ihtisab, what does that mean? That means that they are not going to be lazy then. They are not going to be lazy. This means they're going to worship Allah during the day and during the night. This means that they're going to spend more time in the worship of Allah than doing other things. So you have to keep an eye on yourself that during the day and also during the night, where is my time going? Is my time going just on my phone? Is my time going just in talking, just in cooking, just in cleaning? My time also has to be used in the worship of Allah. The person who expects reward in the hereafter, they prioritize their tasks correctly as well. Because sometimes in the month of Ramadan, people don't manage their time properly. What happens is that as they're close to iftar time, they're like, oh, there's no food, let me cook something. 30 minutes before iftar, they're like, okay, let me cook something. Oh, today I feel like having pakora. Let me make pakora right now. And then they start getting busy in making those last minute treats. But in making those last minute treats, what are they missing out on? That time for making dua. The fasting person, when they break their fast, their dua is accepted. The time before iftar should be spent in making dua. Make a promise to yourself that 15 minutes before iftar, I'm going to get out of the kitchen. I have to be out of the kitchen and tell your children that they should tell you. Huh? Because children love to correct their parents. As much as we love to correct them, they also love to correct us. So tell them, this Ramadan, my rule is 15 minutes before iftar, I have to be out of the kitchen. Can you make sure I do that? So they will remind you, inshallah. Because they know that at that time you create such a chaos. You're yelling at everybody, you're calling them. So they'll be like, mom, 15 minutes left, please, out of the kitchen. And then inshallah you'll be making du'as. The person who expects reward from Allah does not neglect the recitation of the Qur'an during the day. They recite the Qur'an during the day. The person who expects reward from Allah does not leave their morning adkar. They do dhikr in the morning. Because sometimes what happens is that because we've been up since a very long time, then right after Fajr we want to sleep. And when we sleep right after Fajr, we don't make our morning dhikr. If we want reward from Allah, we need to make that morning dhikr. Aisha radiallahu anha, she would recite Qur'an after Fajr, even in Ramadan. And when it was time for Ishraq, she would pray her Ishraq and then take a nap. So maybe you can do something like that also. Stay up for some time after Fajr, make your dhikr, and then go and take your nap if you want to. The one who expects reward from Allah strives hard in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. The one who expects reward from Allah increases in their sadaqah. The one who expects reward from Allah spends more time with the Qur'an. Now let's talk a little bit about the different good deeds that we can do. What are some things that we can focus on in the month of Ramadan? Besides fasting and besides praying in the night, what are some things that we can do? First of all, increase in good deeds as much as possible. And every person is different. I can tell you, pray ishraq. But maybe at that time you're at work or you're at school and it's not possible for you. I can tell you, make dhikr, this dhikr or that dhikr. But maybe that is not possible for you because of your situation. So see what is possible for you. But your goal should be that I want to increase in my good deeds as much as possible. If that means that you can pray two rakah nafil prayer with every salah, alhamdulillah. If that means you can recite three juz every day, alhamdulillah. If that means you can recite one juz every day, alhamdulillah. If that means you can recite half a juz every day, alhamdulillah. If that means you can say subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al-azim a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times in the evening, alhamdulillah. If that means you can say la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer a hundred times during the day, alhamdulillah. Your goal should be that I have to increase in my good deeds. I need to be doing more than what I used to do before. 
Why? Because when the month of Ramadan begins, the gates of the sky are opened. What does that mean? The gates of the sky are open. That send up your good deeds as much as you can. Right? The Prophet ﷺ told us that when the month of Ramadan begins, a caller calls out that, Ya baghi al khayri abshir, or aqbil, in one narration. That, O oh, seeker of good, rejoice. This is your time. Be happy. Meaning now, come forward and increase in your good deeds. So this is a time to increase good deeds. Secondly, we should especially focus on perfecting our obligations. The things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made obligatory on us. Okay, like what? Fasting and the five daily prayers, right? These are obligations. So do them in the best way possible. Improve your salah. How? How can you improve your salah? If generally... The way you pray is that you are rushing. Now in Ramadan, no, no, no rushing. Tell yourself, I'll rush later. Now in Ramadan, I can't rush. Take your time, right? Improve your salah by reciting more Qur'an. Maybe you're in the habit of just reciting, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Alhamdulillah, that's fine. Your salah is valid. But learn a different surah, revise a different surah, and recite that in your salah. Maybe in your rukur, you only say Subhana Rabbi al three times. That's fine. That's valid. But you can also say more adhkar that the Prophet ﷺ would say. So learn those in order to improve your salah. Then increase in your nafil salah. Especially starting from sunnah. Then spend more time with the Qur'an. This Ramadan you have to spend more time with the Book of Allah. I want to ask you a question. When you see the Mus'haf, what do you feel? What do you feel? Tell me honestly, when you see the Qur'an, what do you feel in your heart? Peace, Peace, Peace love. love. Okay, this is the Book of Allah. I'm asking what do you feel? What kind of feelings do you feel? Okay, that this is the truth. What else? This is mercy. Okay, this is a valuable treasure. I'm asking you, what do you feel? Fear? That's an honest answer. She said she feels fear. When she looks at the Quran, she feels fear. I know we all feel iman and love. Yes, this is the book of Allah. But if I ask you to tell me honestly, when you look at the Quran, do you feel shame? Do you feel shame? Yes. Why? I don't know it. I don't recite it. I don't recite it enough. I don't understand it. I don't follow it. We have these feelings? And for some people what happens is that every time they look at the Mus'haf, they get scared, they get shy, they feel embarrassed, they feel guilty, that oh, for so many days I did not read, I am such a bad person. And then because of those bad feelings, they keep staying away from the Qur'an. Don't let shaitan do that to you. Do not let shaitan do that to you. No matter how you have been, even if you did not read the Qur'an for the whole year since last Ramadan, you can still pick it up now. Even if you forgot something of the Qur'an that you memorized once upon a time, you can still pick up the Qur'an. You are still worthy of picking up the Qur'an. Because what is the Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that this is the rope of Allah. وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Who is the rope given to? When is a rope given to someone? Why? Why is it given to them? To help them. To rescue them. If someone is drowning, they're given a rope. Hold on to the rope and I'll pull you out. We are not expected to be perfect. You may feel like you are drowning. You're a bad Muslim. You may feel like you're a really bad person. That for such a long time, you did not even pick up the Mus'haf. You did not review anything of the Quran. You have forgotten most of what you memorized. You may feel like you're a bad person and you need to be rescued. Guess what? The Quran is here to rescue you. 
The Quran is here to rescue you. This is the rope of Allah. No matter who you are, no matter how bad you think you are, you are worthy of picking up the book of Allah. So pick it up. It's never too late. You're never too bad to pick up the Quran. Remember that. The Quran is for all of us. As long as we're alive, we can benefit from this book. لِيُنْذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا So pick it up and read. Even if you sound horrible. Right? Maybe you say to yourself, I sound so bad when I read the Quran. It's okay. It's okay. Read it anyway. Maybe you feel shy to read it in front of other people. Go sit in the car, close the doors and read Quran. Go into the room, close the door and read Quran. Wait, when nobody's home, pick up the Quran and read it. In the night, read it softly. Maybe you get tired, maybe you feel like, I don't know how to read. Then read as much as you know. If you know how to recite the first page of Surah Al-Baqarah only, read that. If you know how to recite the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah only, read that. You know how to recite, Amma yatasa'alun, that page only, read that. You know only how to recite Surah Yaseen, Read that. Whatever you know, read that. But read, recite, and believe in the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. And don't be so hard with yourself that you don't allow yourself to pick up the Qur'an. This negative thought is from shaitan. So this Ramadan, spend more time with the Qur'an. Read it more. Listen to it more. If you struggle to recite, listen to it. And the way that you can listen to it is that you play the recitation, all right? Like for example of Surah Al-Baqarah, and then you open up the Mus'haf, open Surah Al-Baqarah, and follow along. Okay? Look at the text. Follow with your finger or with your pen. All right? Whatever the Qari is reciting, look at the text. And I'm telling you, if you do this for 30 days in a row, inshallah, your recitation will improve a lot. You will learn how to recite the Qur'an. I remember our parents used to do that with us when we were little. This was like a family activity. Me and my sisters, we had to do this. We had to sit at the dinner table. My parents would play the recitation. And then we would have the mushaf open in front of us and we would have to follow it. Not too much. Maybe just for 15 minutes or something. But every day, if you do this, your recitation will definitely improve. Inshallah. And if you can attend a class or listen to a lecture in which they explain the meaning of the Qur'an, attend that inshallah. Spend more time with the Qur'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he used to recite Qur'an in his salah, in his qiyam, and he would also review the Qur'an with Jibreel in Ramadan, where he would recite to Jibreel, and then Jibreel would recite to him. This means that it's so beneficial for us to read the Qur'an ourselves and also to listen to it from other people. Insha'Allah. Also, Qiyam in the night. Make sure that this Ramadan, you pray every single night. I'm not talking about Isha. Not just Isha. After Isha, some Qiyam. And by that, I don't just mean that wake up at 3 a.m. and then pray Tahajjud. You can pray any time after Isha that you pray until Suhoor. That is Qiyam. If you sleep and then wake up and pray, that is called the Hajjud. All right? So any time during the night, whatever works for you, maybe what works for you is right after Isha. Maybe what works for you is the Hajjud. Whatever works for you. But every single night, you make a commitment to yourself that I have to pray in the night. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would pray Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan in a certain place. The Sahaba described it, right? That min hasirin, a certain place where there was like a small wall, right? Because that was his designated place. So you should also have a designated place, a fixed place, even in the masjid. When you go to the masjid, no. Okay, first row, this is my spot. Because when I stand and pray here, I have more khushu. But please, if somebody else is standing there, don't fight them. <laughs> okay? Don't fight them. But you have to try to get there before them, inshallah. Right? And if you cannot do it in the masjid, then at least at home. At home also, pray in the night as much as you can. You might say, I don't know a lot of Qur'an. I have not memorized it. It's okay. Recite, قُلْ ahad. 
ten times in one rakah. Recite Qul Wallahu Ahad again ten times in the second rakah. Pray eight rakah like that. Pray two rakah, four rakah, whatever that you are able to. But every night, pray Qiyam. Because the best prayer after the fard prayer is the night prayer. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. We learn in a hadith that Qiyamul layl draws you close to Allah. So many of you said that this Ramadan, my goal is to draw close to Allah. So how do you draw close to Allah? By praying in the night. And you know, the thing about Salah is that in Salah you can't talk to other people. Nor can other people talk to you. Does it ever happen you're on the phone, you're talking to someone very important, and somebody comes and asks you a question? Yeah? Or somebody rings the doorbell, and you're on the phone, and you're trying to answer somebody's question, and you're also trying to answer the door. Doesn't it happen? Right? Kids do that. Sometimes you go to the bathroom, and people are asking you questions from outside the bathroom door. You're like, please, can I have some quiet time here? <laughs> Subhanallah. The benefit of salah is that it completely cuts you off from people. You cannot talk to people. People cannot talk to you. And you know, this is also our problem, actually. That we, I think as women, a lot of women have this problem. That they cannot help but focus on others. That you are cooking, but while you're cooking, you're telling your son, do this, do that. You're telling your daughter, don't do this, don't do that. Right? It's like your mind cannot focus on one thing at a time. Hmm? Multitasking. So in Salah, what happens? You cannot multitask. You cannot pray Salah and fold laundry at the same time. Wallahi, if it was allowed, we would do it. Alhamdulillah, it is not allowed. Alhamdulillah. So in Salah, you can only pray Salah. This is why through Salah, you draw close to Allah. As-Salatu Qurban, it draws you close to Allah. Because you're reciting Qur'an, you're asking Allah for forgiveness, you're praising Allah, you're glorifying Allah, you're thanking Allah. So Salah has to be a goal in Ramadan, especially the night prayer. And even on the nights when you're tired. I know some nights are very difficult. They can be very difficult. But even on that night, just pray two rakah, pray four rakah. Maybe after that, take some break, take some rest, and then start again. And tell yourself, I will need this later. Hmm? Tell yourself, I will need this later. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would pray in the night, what would happen to his feet? They would swell up. Has this ever happened to you that your feet swell up? When do they swell up? Yeah, on the plane when you're sitting for so long, right? Or when you're pregnant and you've been eating so many nice things that you've been craving, right? Salty food. So, you know, all of that has caused your body to swell up. Happens. I don't know, maybe because it's so hot. The Prophet ﷺ, his feet would swell up in the night prayer. So when you get tired, you know, you start thinking, maybe I should stop now. Check your feet. Are they swollen yet? And then say, Alhamdulillah, they're not swollen yet. I can do it. I can do it, inshallah. I can do it. Go get some water, freshen up, make wudu. Maybe open the window a little bit. Go outside quickly, take some fresh air so that you wake up and then continue to pray. Right? If you feel tired in your body, maybe you know stretch a little bit. Stretch your legs, stretch your back, stretch your arms. Walk in the room or in the masjid a little bit so that your body can be active and then you can pray some more. Because sometimes it can get very discouraging. When you're thinking, maybe I should take a break. And then you look, and yeah, the people praying behind you, they have gone to take a break. They're sitting in the back of the masjid. So you say, okay, I'll also go sit in the back of the masjid. Oh, people are having tea. Let me also go have some tea. And then you go have tea, and you start talking to someone, then you start talking to someone else, and then you find out, oh, they're praying with it. And you missed so much salah. Don't let that happen. Focus on salah. Even if you get tired, push yourself a little bit, inshallah. Also in Ramadan, make a lot of dua. The verses that you heard about Ramadan, in them, there's also the ayah, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي 
فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my slaves ask you about me, indeed I am near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانُ Allah responds to our du'as when we call upon Him. You know what the actual problem is? We don't pray enough. We don't make enough du'a. We think, oh I prayed last week, I prayed last Ramadan, so I'm still waiting for those du'as to become accepted. Making du'a is not like submitting a form. That once you have submitted a form, now you just wait for the answer. No. Making du'a is that you keep praying. The du'a in and of itself is a goal. When you're submitting a form, is the form the goal? No, the form is just a means of getting something. Right? So you submit the application, now you wait for the results. Du'a doesn't work like that. Du'a is that you are making du'a, and you're making du'a, and you're making du'a, and you're making du'a. Du'a is for life. It is for life. Yesterday you were praying for one thing, today you're praying for something else, tomorrow you're praying for something else. Yesterday you were praying for something, today you're praying for that same thing again, and something else. And then tomorrow you're praying for both of those things and more. Dua is for life. So don't ever stop making dua and keep making more and more dua. You know, the Battle of Badr, what happened in the Battle of Badr? Were the Muslims successful? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give victory? Huge victory. 300 Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory against the army of 1,000 men strong. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different things that happened in Badr so that Muslims can take lesson. One of the first things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ When you were calling upon your Lord, when you were begging your Lord for help. And you know what istighatha is? Istighatha is from ghayth. Ghayth is rain. Imagine people have no water in drought. There's no water. How would they beg for rain? How? Desperately. Desperately. They would beg Allah for rain. The Prophet ﷺ, how was he making dua? For a very long time. With his hands, arms up high literally. He wasn't just making dua like this. He was making dua like this. His arms were held up high for so long that his upper shawl, it fell. It fell on the side. And he didn't move his arm to pick up his shawl. He kept holding his hands up. Why? Because he was begging Allah constantly. He was begging and begging and begging. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he saw him and he felt so bad. He felt pity. He said, oh messenger of Allah, you have done enough. You have done enough. This is the dua that we need to make. We worry so much about our health. We worry so much about our brothers and sisters in Gaza. We worry so much about the children in Gaza. The mothers in Gaza. We cry. We see a video, we cry. We get so afraid. We get so worried. We get angry for them. We cry for them. All of these big feelings, please, please turn them into dua. Pray for them like you would pray for yourself. Pray for them like you would pray for your own children. Because the children there are your children. The men and women there are your brothers and sisters. So pray. Don't just sit and worry and cry and feel sad and feel helpless. We are not meant to feel helpless. We have to convert all of these feelings into dua. And dua doesn't just mean that, oh Allah, please help our brothers and sisters in Gaza. What kind of dua is that? I mean, yes, it's dua, you called upon Allah. But cry before Allah. Beg. Say, Ya Allah, they're hungry. Ya Allah, they're tired. Ya Allah, they have been oppressed. Ya Allah, they're afraid. Ya Allah, I am not able to help. Keep calling upon Allah. Keep making dua. Is تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ Whatever you worry about for yourself, for your children, your children's deen, your deen, your iman, your health. Maybe you're worried about your future. Whatever it is that you're concerned about, call upon Allah Azza wa Jal. Make dua when you're breaking your fast. Make dua in the night when you're praying qiyam. Make dua at the time when you are 
up for suhood, especially ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you at that time. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That is the time to seek forgiveness from Allah. Make dua also during the day while you're fasting. Because while you're fasting, you're already engaged in an act of worship. So any time that you're fasting is an excellent time to make dua. But especially when you're completing your fast, when you're breaking your fast, then make dua. And remember in the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially calls us. That is there anyone who will call upon me so that I answer him? Is there anyone who will ask me for something so that I give him? So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night. And especially ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness in Laylatul Qadr. In the last 10 nights of Ramadan, especially the odd nights seeking Laylatul Qadr, Allahumma innaka afuwun, tuhibbul afwa, fa'fu anni. Another thing we have to do in this Ramadan is that we have to spend for the sake of Allah. Give for the sake of Allah. Because when you give something for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies it. By how much? Up to 700 times and more. When you put money in the bank, does it multiply? Does it increase? Actually, it goes less. Right? It decreases. Right? When you give your money to Allah, what does Allah do? First of all, He takes it as a loan. What does that mean? He will return it to you. Secondly, He won't just return it to you the same amount that you gave Him. He will actually multiply it for you up to 700 times and more. Right? In the Qur'an, we learn that the example of those people who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is like that of a seed. When you put the seed in the ground, you feel like, oh, it's gone. It's buried. It's hidden. It's finished. But is it finished? No. Now it's going to grow into a plant that will grow so many more seeds. So many more. A tree that is giving hundreds of fruits, that tree came from what? One seed. Isn't it? So this is what it means to spend in the way of Allah. Allah will give you many times over. And I know it's hard. Especially now when even groceries have become so expensive. Everything has become expensive. There's no doubt about that. But from whatever money you make, whatever money you have, a little bit, take a little bit, a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, and tell yourself, this is my savings for later. I need this later on. This is your commitment to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, those people who spend their wealth in the night and in the day, secretly and openly, they will have their reward with their Lord, and no fear will be on them, nor will they be sad. Those who spend, they will not be afraid on the Day of Judgment. Those who spend in the way of Allah, they will not be sad on the Day of Judgment. They'll be happy. They'll be at peace. We learned that what you give in charity will be your shade on the Day of Judgment. So from now, maybe what you can do is make sure that you have enough change, all right, actual cash, all right, or actual change, so that every time you go to the masjid, you are actually able to put something. Something, even if it's one dollar. Whatever that you can give. Maybe go to the bank and, you know, take a fifty dollar bill and ask them to give it to you in change. Whatever that you can afford. But have that money with you. Because you know what happens when you go to the masjid? You feel like, I want to give sadaqah. You look into your bag, you find nothing. You're like, okay, next time. Next time, next time, next time. When is that next time going to happen? So be prepared. Prepare yourself from before. Also, remember that giving sadaqah. Spending in the way of Allah erases sins just like water puts out fire. Water puts out fire. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever done that? Maybe matches, you know, you light it. And then if you put a whole lot of water on it, what's going to happen? Finish, the fire is gone. And just like that, the fire of your sins, how does it get extinguished? How does it get put out? By your sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever among you is able to shield himself from the fire should do so, even if it is with half of a date. Half of a date. Today I found out that in this masjid, inshallah, there will be iftar every single day in the month of Ramadan. Can you imagine if you are the person who gives money with which the dates are bought? 
and everybody breaks their fast, let's say 100 people break their fast through the dates that you bought, how much reward are you getting for 100 fasts? Because you helped break their fast. You helped them in completing their act of worship. So how beneficial is that? Subhanallah. So make sure you contribute to that, whatever you can. This masjid, any masjid that you go to, especially when you go to eat there, when you benefit from there, contribute. Contribute whatever that you can. And remember, when you give for the sake of Allah, Allah will not leave you empty-handed. Experience this in your life. Who do you give money to? In general, who do you happily spend on? Yourself? Do you really like to spend on yourself? Women don't. Who do you like to spend on? Your children, right? You like to spend on your children. You like to spend on your parents. You like to spend on your loved ones. Do you love Allah? Do you love Allah? Do you? Alhamdulillah. So spend for the sake of Allah. Every day, whatever that you can, in whatever way that you can. We also learned that on the Day of Judgment, the charity that a person gives will be their shade on the day when there is no other shade, right? So your charity will be a shade for you. Have you ever seen, sometimes, you know, like in the airport, there are people in the airplane, they're sitting in such big seats, comfortable, their seats turn into beds, business class, first class, and you're like, wow, mashallah. How does that happen? Why the special treatment? They paid for it. So on the day of judgment, if you want special treatment, you got to pay for it now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask that you spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks that you give something, even if it's half a date, even if it's little, but with sincerity, for His sake, out of love for Him, and with consistency. Another important thing we have to focus on is to be extra good to our relatives. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that whoever wants that his life term should be extended and that his sustenance should be increased. That he should join his ties of kinship. In another hadith, then he should be good to his parents. Help people who you know are in need of help. Because Allah is in the help of his slave as long as a slave is helping his brother. Another important thing is make a lot of dhikr. Remember Allah a lot in the morning, in the evening. Seek forgiveness from Allah. Send salawat. Say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah because it is a treasure of Jannah. Right? Increase in your tasbihat and guard your tongue. Guard your tongue. We get angry, we get annoyed, we get irritated, but please don't let your tongue destroy your good deeds. You have to keep it in control. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever does not leave lying in their fasting, then Allah has no need that this person should leave their food and drink and go hungry. And if a person is lying and saying wrong things and hurtful things, speech that is displeasing to Allah, then their fast will not count. And one last piece of advice. Ibn Mas'ud anhu was asked, that how did you use to prepare for Ramadan? How did you use to welcome Ramadan? He said that none of us would see the new moon of Ramadan while he had in his heart bad feeling for his Muslim brother. Meaning when we would see the new moon, we would clean our hearts. Because if your heart is filled with anger, if your heart is filled with jealousy, if your heart is filled with feelings of wanting to take revenge from someone, someone whom you have not forgiven, you will not be able to find the pleasure, the joy, the sweetness of worship. Let me tell you that. Because everything is then going to become a competition. Some people, they're praying, they're reciting Quran, and what's their goal? Let me show them I'm a good person. Now they can't say anything to me. Some people, they're preparing a thought. But their whole purpose is to impress someone or to prove that I cook better than her. I serve food better than other people. If we do this, we're not focused on Allah. 
Clean the heart. Don't keep anger in your heart. Don't keep jealousy in your heart. Don't keep, you know, bad feelings for other people. Forgive them so that Allah will forgive us. Clean your heart so that your heart is able to focus and worship. And if you struggle with this, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Oh Allah, Allahumma tahir qalbi. Oh Allah, purify, clean my heart so that I can focus on you. Haven't you ever noticed that when you're upset, when you're angry, you can't even focus on your children who are in front of you, who may be talking to you. You can't hear what they're saying because you're so distracted, you're so preoccupied with something else. So clean your heart, inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq, give us all the ability to reach the Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove anything that hinders us from worshipping Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to worship Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ikhlas, sincerity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to recite Qur'an, to pray qiyam, to seek forgiveness, to remember Him, to do things that please Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. Ya Allah, protect them. Ya Allah, they're hungry. Ya Allah, they're tired. Ya Allah, they're afraid. Ya Allah, they're injured. Ya Allah, they're wounded. Ya Allah, you become their safety. Ya Allah, you protect them from ways that we cannot. Ya Allah, everything is in your hand. Ya Allah, you have the power to do all things. Ya Allah, protect them. Ya Allah, help them. Ya Allah, help us help them. Ya Allah, forgive us for our inability. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from every single one of you your coming here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you your sins because of this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in your tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your Ramadan from you. Allahumma ameen. If there's any questions, anything that you would like to share, please raise your hand and I will take the question. Is it better to increase the number of raka'at in Qiyamul Layl or better to increase the length of the recitation? The Prophet ﷺ, his habit was to always pray eight raka'ah in Ramadan and also outside of Ramadan. Okay? So if you do that, pray eight raka'ah, that is excellent. And you want to recite more Qur'an, do that. You want to recite less because your legs are getting tired, you can cut your recitation short and shorten the raka'ah, but that's fine. Bring your ibadah close to the sunnah as much as you are able. All right, as much as you are able, that is excellent for you. However, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was a khalifa and he started the taraweeh in the masjid, he had them lead 20 rak'ah. Why? Because, you know, people would come from work, from their farms after a whole day of working. Not everybody would have the capacity to stand for that long. Right? So they would have shorter qiyam. Okay? And this way, also the benefit is that if someone comes later, they can still catch eight rakah. So whichever masjid you go to, okay, inshallah it's good. Whether they pray eight or twenty, inshallah it's good. If you are praying yourself, okay, you're praying yourself, you're reciting yourself, then it is allowed for you to read from the mushaf. Okay? So for example, if you have a Quran stand, you can put the mushaf on that so that you don't have to move anything. Right? You don't have to pick up anything, you don't have to put anything down, you just, you know, maybe bring the Quran stand closer, that's all you do, and you read from that. Okay? Or if you don't have it, then you have the mushaf right next to you on a table or something, you pick it up and you put it away. Alright? However, if you're praying behind the Imam, you are not reciting, the Imam is reciting. Can you open the mushaf then and follow along? No. That is not correct. Okay? You only open the mushaf in order to read from it. And that is only in nafil prayer, in voluntary prayer, all right? Not in fal prayer. And even in nafil prayer, actually some ulama do say that it is better not to do that. You only recite from memory, which is why I said that if you know only Surah Al-Ikhlas, read that ten times. What I would advise you to do is, whatever negative feelings that you have developed over time towards the Qur'an, you need to replace them with positive ones. And positive ones will come with positive experiences. So find out ways through which you can have those positive experiences with the Qur'an. What are some ways you can do that? First of all, 
recite the Quran as much as you can. Right? And even if you have not recited for many days, it's okay. Tell yourself, I can recite. If you can recite half a page, Alhamdulillah. You can recite one page, Alhamdulillah. You didn't get to recite yesterday, you get to recite today, Alhamdulillah. Reciting some Quran is better than reciting no Quran. And as you will recite more and more Quran, you will actually feel a sense of accomplishment. That Alhamdulillah, I'm reading. You complete Surah Al-Baqarah, you're like, Alhamdulillah, wow. Yes, it took me three months, but yeah, I did it. You complete Surah Ali Imran, you're like, yes, Alhamdulillah, it took me another month, but Alhamdulillah, I did it. You reach the halfway point, and then one day, inshallah, you will read Surah Al-Nas also. So as you will complete the recitation, you will feel a sense of accomplishment. And you know when you're on a good streak, that good streak itself becomes a source of motivation. So I would say the way you can have this positive experience is that you can recite more Quran, inshallah. Another thing is find people who can help you have those positive experiences with the Quran. Find a class where you can learn the meaning of the Quran, where people can help you understand the meaning of the Quran. And inshallah, inshallah, once you start learning the meaning of the Quran, you will fall in love. You will fall in love with the Quran. You will pick up the Quran and you will say, Hada kalamu Rabbi. This is the word of my Lord. You will want to make sure you have Mus'haq with you everywhere you go. You will have your personal Mus'haq that will be a part of you. That will be your companion. You will not be able to imagine your day your week, your life without the Qur'an, insha'Allah. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, give me the ability to draw closer to you through your book, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah, we will conclude here. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you for your patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this beneficial for all of us. Ameen. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته